uh, mobile medical formations, that is to say, those which are intended to accompany armies in the field, and the fixed establishments of the medical services shall be respected and protected by the belligerents. Then it goes on to explain that the protection to which medical formations and establishments are entitled will cease if they are made use of to commit acts harmful to the enemy. So that's probably the two key um, take-homes for the, from the Geneva Convention in terms of our discussion today. So I'm sure because of our location and the interest of the group, the COVID Memorial, that you're pretty familiar with the campaign itself. So I don't intend to go back over the whole campaign. Does anyone, everyone feels comfortable enough that they understand enough about the campaign that they yeah. need to go back over it? So basically, I just wanted to show you where Google was located. So it's, you know, up on the northeastern coast towards the Solomon Sea in the area where the beachhead battles were fought, Goma Buna in San Fernando. So in my mind, it sort of sat a bit like in the centre of the spokes of the wheel. And, and so it became a key location for those battles. So the attack on the medical station at Saputa occurred in late November as those battles were unfolding and those actions came to represent the centrepiece of the Allied offensive in Papua. So again, I won't really go back through all of that um, in terms of context and time frame, but this is just towards the air at times, October, November, December and into January um, as they were arriving then. So that's the little diary that started it all. Um, I didn't bring it because it's so precious, I'm always scared that I'm going to lose it. And I leave it tucked away in a little camping box at home with these medals and bits and pieces. But um, his unit, the second Corps Field Ambulance, arrived in Port Moresby in September 1942, and along with members of the second six Field Ambulance and the 14th Australian Field Ambulance, which is a militia unit, they were the only units providing medical aid to the soldiers all along the Kokoda track for the duration of the campaign. Um, so by mid-November, the 2nd, 4th and just a small group of the 2nd and 6th um, arrived at Kokoda and after a few days of treating the casualties there, they started to move towards the coast to continue the medical support of the fighting soldiers. So the northern section of the track took the men through Oi Ferrari. We had to talk about that by John Tanner the last talk here a few months ago. Uh, Sangara Mission was another place in Pop and Debbie, we have heard of those locations, and then they reached Sakuta. So how things worked out was uh, Myola had been another big key area where the medical units set up, and the intention was that they were going to be able to evacuate lots of the casualties from Myola, and then the second, fourth, and the second, sixth together would move forward towards the beachheads, ready for the massive amounts of casualties they expected. But what happened was there was actually never any great plan to evacuate the um, casualties. The planes couldn't land, the ground was muddy and marshy, the planes crashed. There were only about three planes, and they could take about two patients at a time. So as a result, most of the patients, and therefore most of the medical staff of the second, sixth, remained at Myola to care for them for months. The last of those patients didn't leave till December. Um, and so only a handful went through the second floor, so they were at a disadvantage to start with. Um, so their assets not only impacted on the level of care that could be given to the soldiers, but also on the strain that was put on the second floor personnel. Um, so they were all exhausted being there since September. So imagine when the Americans arrived, they started to arrive towards the end of November as well. And they were very welcome because they were able to help out. The Australians and the Americans worked quite well together. Sometimes we had a bit of a dig at the Americans, but they worked quite well together. And I tell you what, they were quite well resourced and we were always well resourced. So they were very willing and able to help with resources, personnel, and they helped to operate. Um, we operated on each other's casualties as well. So there were some photos from the photo album as well. Just to give you an idea what a so-called medical station looked like. There wasn't, wasn't a lot of structure to it, so you're basically under a tent fly, um, set up in the jungle, generally in a clearing, mainly so that they could be found easily by the people bringing the casualties back. 
that becomes an issue later on as well. So yeah, pretty rough old times. <coughs> so this is just to focus on the Saputa events. Um, as the fighting intensified, Vic and Bill were among just six officers and 42 other ranks of the second floor, caring for hundreds of casualties at Saputa. So they had a dire lack of personnel and equipment before they even started. So for example, on the 23rd of November, the main dressing station held over 350 casualties. And their commanding officer, Hobson, lamented that there was, quote, the usual shortage of medical and ordnance stores, cooking gear and shelter. So they basically had just about everything or not much of everything. So the Allied attack on Goma was scheduled to commence in the final days of November. So in anticipation of the devastation that was about to happen, Hobson organised as many casualties as possible to be taken by whatever means possible from Saputa back to the airstrip at Popendetta. Um, which was where they were going to then wait, hopefully, for plane evacuation to Port Moresby. The important thing to note is that medical evacuation was never a priority at any stage of the campaign. They set off, I don't know what they thought was going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> and I am probably overcritical that it comes from years of looking at this, and I just cannot see how they didn't figure out, you know, that this was going to happen. But basically, they relied on the planes that went up to supply to come when they were coming back empty. They were relying on them to backload with the casualties. Most of the pilots and planes there were American. And so Hobson sent the um, unit's dental officer, Watson, basically to persuade, to cajole, to bargain and to barter with the lives of these men. And it got down to a point of even saying, um, so many casualties were worth so many Japanese captured helmets or swords or guns. They were doing their barter system. They'd give the pilots something in return for them taking the casualties out. So as Watson himself later recalled, he said, this awful degrading barter went on from dawn to dusk with the result that all of the 450 casualties were airlifted back to Fort Moresby that day. But there were many more that still remained at Saputa. I'm just going to have to grab a drink because I'm running out. So on the day after that had happened, and we've got 450 of them out, the main dressing station at Saputa, this is a photograph of what happened afterwards, in the afternoon of November 27th, was attacked from the air by a number of Japanese Zero planes. So the first description up here is what Nick wrote in his diary, um, just to explain what it was like. So there was heavy machine gun fire, Air of bombardment. He says 36 were killed, 70 were wounded. The officer commanding the companies killed, that was Major Vickery, so he was a doctor, and Major McDonald, also a doctor. So Nick says there's not much left here, dead, mangled bodies, blood, guts, and mud. And as he notes, none of them will forget it. Great boys paid the supreme sacrifice. Bill, that's his brother, buries most of the dead, but it takes till midnight before the last of them are covered in. The next account is the official one from the unit diary. And so you can see a difference in the number of casualties. I still haven't really definitely established the number of casualties. There's great variations. But the official diary says that 22 were dead and a large number wounded. They hit just about all of the tents in the medical station. But immediately afterwards, the personnel went back to their jobs, collected the wounded, treated them, and put the dead aside for burial. And then the bottom one is, He's a bit of a character, old Frank. He was the assistant director of medical services up there, and this was from his biography uh, called No Memory for Pain, which was published in the 70s. And he tells it this way, that they were sitting on logs discussing planes, and then without warning, there was, they heard the planes, there was machine gun fire, bombs exploded, all over in a matter of seconds, 15 dead, 23 wounded, hearts set on fire, and all standing over with burning flesh. So, I don't think anyone can explain it better than the guys who were there, in their own words. So, this is just a couple of photos on the War Memorial website. This is the men in the second floor gathering up some of their dead comrades and their patients, wrapping them in blankets for burial. 
And this was the original secluded cemetery with the graves just marked with a rough old cross. Um, secluded cemetery expanded and expanded, and at one stage it became like a, an official war cemetery up there. Then the bodies were eventually disinterred and moved to the Vamana cemetery. Mm -hmm. Um, so Catherine and Carrie were among the dead and wounded, it's an important uh, point to make, as were Australian medical personnel and the injured and sick Australian soldiers who were patients at the time of the attack. So imagine for these poor guys, they'd come back to what they thought was a safe place with their injuries. Um, at least five Australian soldiers who were not associated with the field ambulance or the security main vessel station were killed or wounded. So they were working in the Central Commission headquarters or with other units. And at least five Americans from a nearby US 107th Medical Battalion <coughs> also died. And so the circumstances around these casualties I'll look at later. So this next one was another unique um, bit of evidence that was in that little ice cream container my dad gave me with Nick's diary. This was a hand-drawn sketch. It's on the old little white sort of paper we had <laughs> school books as kids. Um, so I think it must have been done in the 1960s. It's all smudged here. Um, and, and even with the numbers, it's hard to figure out his numbers exactly. But it's a sketch of that day and what happened. And to me, it's just such a valuable historical piece of evidence. <coughs> Up the top, it's quite confronting, so I don't advise. I don't always show it, but then I think, I don't know. I don't know what's the right thing to do, but he's actually talked about the terrible injuries these men sustained. Um, he's also showed where all of the... Uh, Tents were set out where the bombs hit, where the personnel of the second floor died, the cemetery, where they're buried. And this is interesting here, he's got these groups of AIS soldiers buried. <coughs> um, I did contact the section that looks after, that goes back and looks for the missing graves. Mm -hmm. I never heard back from them, it was years ago, and I probably should get in touch with them again because I don't know if they were buried there completely separately, or whether they were laid put into the food of all things, which I'm not sure. Yeah. And then this is that photo, another photo of showing the devastation um, after the, the attack. So, um, I'm just talking about the hair drawn sketch <coughs> and where I found it. Um, then, sorry, Joanne. Yes. Who were buried at these, in these two separate? Well, he's just marked there that it was um, 21 AIF soldiers. This one, I think maybe it's 18 or it could be a 28 AIF. And that's what I'm saying. I don't know if they were, I don't know if they relate because I can't find anything that says people were buried outside the Sakuta Cemetery, the ones that were killed in the attack. Mm -hmm. But then I think, why is he marked them there on this, which is supposed to represent the whole attack? Mm -hmm. So I'm really not sure. And it changes the numbers significantly. Do you know what 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 date he, he, wrote, he drew drew that? Um, I'm just trying to work this out. I've had my magnifying glass out. I've had I've scanned it. June? It looks like June, mm -hmm. and I don't know if that looks like a blobby 1960 or something. I don't know. Uh, it, it's, maybe the paper sort of tells me that it was it was later. It was much later. He died in 1976. Mm -hmm. um, I really don't know. He never spoke about, about it. Um, so yeah, this might be another book, you know. <laughs> Investigate it further, I think. Um, so the other thing that adds to this, well, the point is in the story, so he's written there the names of the people who were killed, the terrible injuries they had and where they fell. But it's when you see the photos of these guys, you know, um, that's what brings it home to you. And it, my book does mention I've got a little piece of that, each of the people from the second floor field ambulance who were killed. Mm -hmm. um, and a bit about their background, where they came from, and, and their families. Um, so these are just some of the seven members of the second floor field ambulance who were killed. The larger photo there, I just love that guy with his big smile, it's Gordon Pugh. Mm -hmm. He survived the attack, despite receiving severe head wounds. But then he was evacuated back to Moresby by plane, he came onto Australia by hospital ship and then on to Tamworth Grace Hospital by train, but he died on New Year's Eve in 1942. So can, why did he go to, I'm from Kimberell, why did he go to Tamworth? I know there was a... His family were from up that way, ah, so, so I don't, 
I don't know. I was shooting. I think there was a. There was a certainly an army base. Oh, there was. Yeah, it was still a little. One of the. What would they call the thing? They had a special term in the hospital yeah. there. Just like a little base hospital. Um, and I was just assuming that maybe because his family were there. Because the little base hospitals were scattered all around the place. Mm -hmm. Whether they thought they knew that he wasn't going to make it and to take him close mm -hmm. to his family, I don't so know. So I read that in your book, and I wondered why, mm -hmm. because you know the others, um, they should go to Port Moresby. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Well, they couldn't care for him at Port Moresby. I mean, the hospital at Moresby was quite basic, but it really only opened and started um, operating fully around about this time, beginning of October, the nurses went back, there were no nurses there till then. And that's pretty much why the second force and the second six had to operate, and literally operate. Normally a, a dressing station like this was for um, quick bit of a fix up, a bit of first aid, and then ship them back to a clearing station, and then back onto the main hospital. But really, the, the guys in the field were acting as the hospital, a because of the logistics of getting them back, but also the facilities at that main hospital, it wasn't really up and running. There wasn't enough staff, and they actually had to leave a lot of field ambulance guys back in Port Moresby because there were no female nurses because they'd been evacuated for fear of the war with the Japanese, so they took them back to Australian mainland. During the Second World War, I worked with the Chapter of Rome, the facility came out from the Second World War, and that was a major recruitment centre yep. and a major training centre, okay. major training centre. In New South Wales, yep. I would think the medical facilities would be pretty good. Yeah, yeah. But also, police had some good facilities too, so I'm not really sure. Because they, they, they came back a lot around Atherton too, so I'm um, back from Tablelands in Brisbane, so yeah, I'm not sure. Um, so, just to finish off the section of what happened and when it happened, this is a magnificently named Carlton George Parrot. Um, and I found this, there's a, I don't know if you're familiar with the film archive that's, that you can go into where people have the foresight to interview lots of the veterans and they've done really long interviews and they're all transcribed. And I only recently found Carlton's interview, which the full extent of it runs for 10 cassette tapes and goes for three hours or so, I think it is. Um, he was a 23-year-old private from the 2nd 2nd Infantry Battalion. He's actually from Newcastle, my hometown. And he was being treated for fever and dysentery in the Sapuva dressing station at the time of the attack. So his first-hand account, to me, is a historically important, and it's as historically important as it is matter-of-fact in quintessentially Australian in the way he tells it. Um, at the end of the whole interview, he, he actually thanks the interviewer, and he says, I didn't think that was that much important. I hope it's been somehow been here, what you're doing. So. And, I mean, I'm just so grateful that just for these six minutes, because I have no account of someone who was actually in there. I've had written accounts, I've got the map, I've got photos, but this is a man who was actually in there. And now that we have, thanks to Stephen, an internet connection, you might get to hear it. So this goes for about five minutes or so. Yeah. The initial sickness, of the, you know, was the medication and that. And uh, the doctor said to me, "Well, you'll be able to go back to unit tomorrow. We'll be unit start running up the road uh, all day long, and uh, at night you could hear the fire was just up the road. This was the front line was just up the road, you know. And uh, during the daytime, there was American bombing planes come over, and there was." Uh, Occasionally there'd be Japanese planes and biscuit bombers would be dropping. They, they still hadn't established a good dropping ground. Kokoda airstrip was, wasn't much good because when it rained, the planes got bogged and sometimes it, it wouldn't, the planes could take down a couple of days at a time. It would take 48 hours for to dry out and all that. And, uh, they were clearly the Kinnamon grass and that, uh, just behind Sepulchre, a place called Poppendetta. And uh, to make a history, and uh, just just to, to clarify for a moment, what 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 was the illness that you had? Malaria and dysentery. Uh, and how? And so, what happened to you after this? Were you, you you could hear all this action going on in the background. Mm -hmm. um, 
What, what happened to you in terms of where you went after this point? Well, I'm just saying, like, uh, he said to me he could be able to go back to the unit tomorrow. And uh, I said, yeah, right, I was prepared to go back to the unit. Well, uh, that was in the morning. Uh, the day before, eight Japanese aircraft had circled at, at the, the main dressing station. And they'd already had uh, the second floor of the already rigged up a 15 foot white sheet with a red cross in the centre of it, in the middle of the tent. There's only tent flies, and you laid, you, you laid on the floor on the grass, you know, that was the bed. And they'd operated in, a t in a one tent with tilly lamps, and they worked all night. And there were three tents of mud on the floor in places, you know. But they did, that's the way they were work. It was like a hospital where, you know. But she couldn't get back to Horsley. They had to be looked after there. And uh, so uh, these planes circled the place and uh, they flew away and we thought they'd recognise the Red Cross. You know. But when the morning, like if the doctor said you'd be able to go, go back to the unit the next day, at the, the day after this, he said this to us the day after the Japs observed the place. Well, uh, he no sooner got it out of his mouth than uh, the Japanese planes come in at low level and they blew the place to pieces. They killed the two, two main surgeons, 22 blokes, wounded 50 in the wounded and sick again. And uh, in my, under my tent fly alarm, the, Two men were killed outright, one bloke had his feet blown off, and he was sitting there thinking, out, help me, help me. Well, the muscles of his legs hanging down in strips, and uh, I couldn't help him, I didn't know, even know what to do. And, uh, I did help some of the other boys that bandaged them up, because uh, most of the medical staff were wiped out for the, for the while there. After that, and me and another bloke went around bandaging the blokes up. And were, it put a terrible lot of shrapnel wounds from the bursting bombs, you know. And the staff did a sparring too. And uh, like you, 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 when you wrapped it, they wound up and covered it, they sort of were wonderful, yeah. <laughs> but uh, we probably done the wrong thing half the time, but. Uh, you, you were helping with the wounded? Yeah. Were you, were you wounded yourself at all? No, I was never just got a bloke next to me laying on the side of me. We rolled over when we were the bombing and that started flattened down on the ground like, uh, to avoid being hit with shrapnel. Uh, the bloke next to me had a, a slip right across his back, about a quarter of an inch deep. It must have been two foot across of an angle across his back and only went in about a quarter of an inch all the way to scratch him, you know. But the uh, haversacks men in the tent were uh, old with shrapnel, boots were old with shrapnel, and uh, Two men down one end and killed out the other bloke had his feet blown off. Uh, you feel it even that blast, you feel it, I think it was an explosion, you know. But, uh, so after after this bombing, you were helping the others yeah, to, yeah. To, to, to try and save the. Uh, the advantage of that, you know. Uh, but, uh, well, the, Eventually, the staff was reorganised, and uh, oh, I slept that night. And uh, in the morning, they got a bit of organisation going, and they cooked a bully beef stew. And I remember eating a, a, a biscuit full of bully beef stew alongside, I suppose, a, a dozen of the dead, which were wrapped up in grey army blankets, just over to one side. And flies were over and over the bodies, you know. But, uh, a, we were still eating food. <laughs> and I surveyed the area where the tent flies were. Uh, so if you understand, it just with tent flies without any signs in the tent because you couldn't have lived in the humidity with the tent flies. With its full tents. And all you needed was a bit of shelter from the rain. Isn't that? Yeah, so it's a great account. I mean, I just thought that was gold to find that. And, and you, they all speak so well, the veterans, so if you get a chance to, uh, 
to, to listen to any of them. Um, it's just such a great source. And I'm, now I'm going to have to go back and see if anyone else mentions it. I don't even know how I stumble on it, but I'm so glad I did. And just that quintessential Australian way he tells that story. You know, you just imagine sitting there at the booby bed and you've got the bodies just near them. It's just... Um, so that really brings it home to, to us what we're looking at. And if you remember, he... Um,
were these incidents. So he seems to have concentrated on these really big incidents. His inquiries and investigations were all conducted in secret because the war was going on, and they were often, um, well, they were all instigated as a result of various rumours and stories coming back about atrocities. So the government got this role in as a way to try and see what the truth of them were. I've highlighted the bottom couple because they're specifically concerned with the medical personnel um, and also the sinking of the hospital ship Centaur, I guess, is also related. Um, so there are different levels of war crimes, which I'll just flip through quickly here, which sounds a bit um, unco it's an uncomfortable reality that you have different classifications of war crimes, but they were dealt with in different ways. The two quotations at the bottom are probably key to understanding some of the limitations. So Cecil Hurst, who is the chairman of the UN War Crimes Commission, um, basically explained that they want material before them that shows there's reason to believe a war crime's been committed, a war crime of reasonable importance, and that there's good reason to think that there might be a conviction. Now Webb clarifies too, he says, I've been asked to report whether there's been any war crimes. Um, on the part of the members of the enemy forces. But as he says, the answers largely depend on whether the rules of evidence apply. But the UN nation doesn't require him to find it was a war crime, just that there might be enough evidence of something important enough that could be tried as a war crime with a hope of a conviction. So this is just a brief bit about the UN war crimes and the International Military Tribunal in the Far East. Um, so Webb actually went on to be appointed as Australian judge in the Tokyo trials and he later oversaw, he was um, presided over the whole, um, all the judges from Allied Nations. 28 military, uh, 28 Japanese military leaders were tried. Judges were handed down in 48, seven were sentenced to death and executed and 16 to life in prison. So again, I'll just um, explain that he, had three commissions, first, second, and third. Um, that's the areas that they mainly looked at. So the first one, which looked at Saputa. The second one was um, about individuals against <coughs> Australians. And the third one looking about Australians and others, so Indigenous people, different countries. They prepared their cases, they prepared the reports, and they passed them through to the government, and then they were considered by the government which, which ones they put on to be examined as a war crime. So in 1943, we looked at the Saputa incident. But before we started, he explained, we had no eyewitnesses to most of the Japanese war crimes, and the few eyewitnesses we had were probably far to identify the culprits. To the average Australian, the soldiers would all look alike, and no witness has yet given a description that could be expected to lead to the arrest of any Japanese, um, you know, supposed war crime, war criminal. So, this is just looking at Saputa again, and I'm just going to pass these around um, just to explain that. You might do. So, the decision as to which sense one, there's an Australian one and an American one there. The decision as to which personnel will be called to give evidence was based on the answers given by personnel to initial questionnaire. So, this is an example of what you're looking at there. So I've just highlighted the first two because they're the most relevant to Saputa. So they, if anyone's answered it and said that they had some evidence of a possible war crime, they had to produce details, when, where and under what circumstances, they had to identify other witnesses and they had to state what evidence could be provided. So then if they formed the opinion that the Japanese had honourably conducted the war, they had to sign a statement. And if it was determined that they had not so conducted the war, the personnel had to produce the evidence and testify in front of them. So that's what the handwritten questionnaires look like. And there was a slight difference with the American ones. What was interesting was even at this relatively late stage, the judges themselves were confused as to how the rules or what rules of war applied to the Japanese but also to the Americans. They said um, at one stage Webb asked his uh, offside at Noel Sexton, who was from the Commonwealth Crown Solicitor's Office, <coughs> to quote, find out if there is at Newcastle or Sydney some officer who will give us authoritative evidence stating precisely what rules are there in the US Army 
about the armbands, the Red Cross armbands the person I had to wear, and what are the Japanese rules? Is there any known Japanese army rule about treating all who do not wear the distinctive Red Cross markings as combatant troops? So we weren't even really sure what rules applied. So the armband we're talking about, this is another precious article that I bought, a smart index armband. And what strikes you is how tiny it is. So I'll just pass it around here to have a look at it. So that's what they're talking about when they talk about a brassard or an armband. So it wasn't just you could go up and say the Japanese have done such and such. You had to fill out the questionnaire, and you had to stand before where you had to give the evidence. He got to grill you very closely, and then he decided whether there was enough evidence to go ahead and, and um, send it on for further investigation. So in terms of Sapuda, there were two key factors that helped him reach his verdict. Mainly the display of the Red Cross protection symbol and markings, and also were there any military establishments, legitimate targets, close to the Sapuda main dressing station. So we've got a few sample testimonies. Oh, that's just, sorry, that's just back to the Red Cross markings, what the Geneva Cross says. They have to hoist the Red Cross flag. They must indicate that the formations and establishments, they have to be visible to the enemy's forces. And again, if they want the privilege of protection, the personnel um, have to be exclusively engaged in this action of treating the wounded or administering the establishments. So some of the samples of the testimonies, they say the Red Cross was this big, 16 by 14, 15 yards from the road, it was about 20 foot from the road, the Red Cross on the ground was 7 or 8 yards, 25 yards, 15 by 15, so you can see there's an inconsistency with the distances and the size, but they're all saying there was a Red Cross flag on the ground. That photo there is just to give you an indication of just how close the medical establishment was to the road. That road ran from the air strip up to the front line. All the trucks, the troops, the weapons, the jeeps went through there. And on that pole, this is the Australian flag, can you see a little something over there? That's the Red Cross flag. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the flag they're flying, and then supposedly this is the flag they have on the ground. Can you see there? There was debate when that flag, about that flag, that photo um, being taken. We wanted to find the original. It was produced, that photo was produced, and he said, was it taken by an official person? Where's the original? They had a bit of back and forth, and no one could produce it. But no one knows whether it was deliberately taken like that to say, there's the flag, there's the evidence. Not really sure. So, related to the Red Cross brassards, that's the armbands, I've just got a bit of info about that because it all ties in with having the appropriate displays. There was argument as to whether they should wear the brassards or not. So, this is our armband. This is um, the senior medical officer in the gallery and he was Maroon McCloss, the Assistant Director of Medical. He said wearing it made you a target rather than getting protection. So often they took them off. Remember we're thinking, was this a war crime or was it a legitimate act of war when they were attacked? So there's debate about how clear the flag was, where it was, how big it was. There's debate about how many of the men were wearing the armbands. And if you move on to the bottom section there, he says everyone at Brigade Headquarters being issued with hand grenades. So he said to Potts, the Brigadier, do you think I should carry hand grenades? And he said, quite definitely, I think you should. So in terms of the Geneva Convention, it says what you can and can't be doing to get protection. All of this adds to our future. So I think around this stage, you're sort of asking yourself, so are there varying degrees of compliance? Um, are there degrees of atrocities? Which rules do we have to follow? Which ones can be bent and which ones can be broken? So there's an Ian Kingsley Norris who is the head guy of the medical services in Papua at the time. Another interesting character. And his responses to Justice Works questions are stunningly candid and honest. And importantly for this discussion, they highlight the ambiguities and realities of war, the shades of grey that lie between the black and white articles of the Geneva Convention. So this is what Kingsley Norris says about 
the breast bars, the arm bands, he says, no, they haven't been worn. Were you wearing anything? Has he got shot at? Were you wearing anything to distinguish you from a looking soldier? No. I don't suggest I was deliberately shot at, they're very bad shots. <laughs> um, <laughs> he says, it was an operational matter as to whether any, a medic unit displays any signs at all. The operational side, G side, general duties, general side, I'm assuming, um, may say and often says we don't want to disclose any signs on anything. So as senior medical officer, he would ask the headquarters whether they were supposed to display the signs. And then he said, I personally always carried a grenade and declined any protection whatsoever. And he also left his ID card behind, which identified him as medical personnel. Mm -hmm. And so the judge says, you were entitled to do that. And he said, yep, I won't claim both, won't have both ways. I won't claim protection and then kill a Japanese. And he said, so you're carrying arms for protection? And he said, yeah, see, so it's okay. <laughs> so the ambiguity again. And what about our American friends? At least five members of the American 107 Medical Battalion were killed as a result of the same attack at Sakuta. So this is an account from um, the history that one of the books down in the 107 um, and talks about that they basically realised that the Japanese weren't following the Geneva Convention, so they decided they'd add armaments to the rifles that had been issued. And they're saying the Japanese bombed the strafed the hospital, several were killed. So they stopped displaying the big red cross and they stopped wearing the armbands. Um, so in the end, oh, sorry, this is our friend Frank again. He um, said only Americans departed from that display. He absolves himself of his responsibility here. So the Americans decided that. You can see there, he gave an instruction they had to use a red and white flag, but they produced a thing in white and black. And then, could that be confused with something else? Yes, white and black flags used for dropping supplies. So instead of displaying a red and white flag for medical protection, and so he said it was so confused, and the Americans actually dropped 40 feet and it was on their own end. Hmm. People were actually killed by falling cans of blue beans. In a war. I mean, it's just Quicker than me. Sorry? Quicker than me, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the less painful you reckon. <laughs> um, so, at Samuta, this event we're talking about, he said, I don't think there was any Red Cross on the American uh, establishment, uh, except one on a road that they wouldn't be able to see from the air. They didn't display any Red Cross. They had a black and white cross, and that could be indicating a military establishment. So, in the end, uh, after hearing the bulk of the evidence, when concluded, despite all of that, he concluded that the Australian main dressing station was clearly marked in the conventional way. So at this point, he said, yes, the Japanese did breach the Geneva Convention because it was clearly marked. Mm -hmm. So even though there was ambiguity about a lot of it, he said they had the flag out, so it could well have been a, um, a breach of the Geneva Convention. But then you've got to consider the other issue about the proximity to military installations. So again, there's the, there's the hospital, as we call it, hospital main dressing station, and there's the road. And there it is again. Now that jet there is supposedly waiting to transport casualties. But if you're a plane flying over the top and you're seeing all the jeeps coming and going, the guns coming and going, and it's so close to that hospital, you can see some of the issues. Um, so, what other things might have been there as a target? We'll look at that. The 7th Division headquarters was only 100 yards away. The road ran alongside the medical artillery, had been up and down the road all day. The main track was transferring the men, would be a couple of 25 pounders for the long day before. Were they near the hospital when it was bombed? No, but they had to go through it to pass it. And it just talks about how it was situated on the road, more or less on the road. And there again, examples of them evacuating the um, patients from there. So the 25 pounder guns, that's them there. So um, excerpts from the official history paint a vivid picture of the action taking place around Sakuta, all while the second floor third ambulance. Dressing station sat precariously and quite literally in the firing line. 
So it's fair to say the testimony of one soldier, Private Reginald Balfour, planted the initial seeds of doubt in Justice Wood's mind and ultimately led him to a very different conclusion as to the culpability of the Japanese in this attack. So he's putting all of this together, he's going, yeah, maybe they had the markings, oh, hang on, it was pretty close. And then Balfour comes along and tells, fills in a few of the, um, the um, gaps. He says, the Japanese reconnaissance planes, remember they said the planes came over a couple of days before the attack? So they were taking photographs, and at that time, 25 pounds of gun was driven into the hospital grounds. Within 25 years, yards, yards of the Red Cross, and the driver of the jeep said that he knew the planes were Japanese, and that's why he took it there. So now um, Webb says, well, because of this, I'm going to call for some more evidence. Um, one of the people he talked to was Lance Sergeant Tom, Laurie Thompson. And I actually spoke to Laurie years ago, and he's passed away since. And I asked him if he remembered that incident. He said, oh, I promise I do. I said, no, they brought it on the grounds. He remembered it distinctly. So he said that it was brought onto the grounds of the hospital, very close to the Red Cross. But they stayed a few minutes and uh, then they moved on. So other, others testified similarly. Um, they saw the jeep, they saw a 25 pounder. There was a dispute about whether it came into the grounds or not. Bill, my uncle Bill actually gives more testimony here. And he says it was, he saw the guns passing through at the time, but he says not exactly true. Red Cross was 25 yards from the road, so it was sort of there or thereabouts. So the other big military target is the American Hospital, was in a direct line, 500 yards, Division Headquarters. That's the Australian 7th Division Headquarters, in a direct line, three or 400 yards from the dressing station. And all of these were bombed and strafed. And this is where the military installations or targets could have been legitimate. Division Headquarters is about 200 yards down the track. So really Norris, that's Frank Norris in the sketch, did a sketch and said, well, basically, was it jungle? Was it disguised? They said, well, it was slightly tinted. I don't think Albanese is any relation to any Albanese. I haven't found him. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, this is an idea of the, I'm oh, sorry, so just some more, just saying the same thing about the 7th um, Division headquarters location. So, you can see why there's a dispute about how far away it was whether it was chemified or whether it wasn't, it was there. That's the sketches that, um, that's what Balfour did. Um, so on this one, he's got several of the headquarters here. He said that's the airstrip, there's the headquarters, there's the main dressing station, there's the American hospital. Oh, look what's near the American hospital. The brigade headquarters. This is the Garua River, and this is the road to the front, front line. And then this is Norris's recollection, and he swaps them around. He's got the headquarters between the third ambulance, the American hospital, but he's at a radio station near there. This is the road to Jambora, and this is the front line of San Fernando. And there was a camp of a couple of people here in the Pompendetta airstrip. So whoever's right or wrong as to exact locations, I think the question is, or the point is how close it was, so the other thing I've come across since is aerial photographs that were submitted as evidence. And I've enlarged this, and I haven't analysed it closely, and people who know military things tell me, if you know. Um, I can't tell, I don't know, which is the field ambulance, which is the dressing, the um, American hospital, and which is the duty headquarters. But for our purposes, I'm not sure it matters a lot, you can just, that shows you how close things were. Mm -hmm. So any thoughts? Anyone? My thought was that that was the, the medical. But then when you look at how close that road was, to it, it looks like it's set back for it. So I'm not sure. Um, what about up, you see that little section there, you follow the road along, mm -hmm. it seems to be some tents there. Yeah, up in here. Yeah. 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 back further. All right. There. There, yeah. 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 I'm not really sure. 
But as I say, I still think it's valuable because it just gives you an idea of the proximity of one to the other. Um, so, was it legitimate? I mean, this is, this is our question. Um, so the questions that I felt need an answer in here, I'm on the home stretch, so, um, did the field ambulance make the mistake in setting up so close to 7th Division headquarters? Or did 7th Division headquarters del deliberately establish itself close to the main dressing station to get protection? That was my dear old dad's thoughts. Mm -hmm. My dear old dad was an old saint, like he served in Korea. And when I told him about what I'd found, and I said, I was so outraged about this bombing, and I said, 7th Division headquarters is right near, and he said, yeah, that'd be bloody right. <laughs> and I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, oh, can you get the protection from the medical? Yeah. Well, there's a controversy. <laughs> I don't like it. So um, I started looking into that. And when I went to put it in my book, and I actually put it in my book, and my first book was published in conjunction with the Australian Army. And they went, <laughs> But when they reviewed it, they said, you've got enough evidence there that, yeah, I wasn't. I don't know how they're going to stop me putting it in anyway, but they thought I supported the argument well enough to plant that seed. Because what I showed them was who got there first, because I think that's the key, isn't it? Mm. So who got there first? So I got it from their diaries. The second floor fell in this diary said, Major McDonald, who was later killed at Saputa, left Papa Dinner at Saputa at 1200 hours on the 20th of November. So at 21 hours, he called with a signal saying he was already holding 40 patients and he's already done these operations and asking for assistance. So they sent more personnel on from Papandetta to Saputa in an old Chevy Hill. So you could argue that by that stage, on that day, there was a field ambulance established there. Not full, but it was established, the forward unit was there. Then the following day, at 8 o'clock, Headquarters of 7th Division closes Popham Dead and reopens at 1 o'clock in the afternoon at Saputa. So then on the 21st, at 2 o'clock, the rest, the main party of the 2nd floor field ambulance gets there. But there were already three tents and 60 patients there. So that was my proof that the Army said, right up, maybe you've got enough there, you can at least plant the seed. Because that shows that 7th Division headquarters opened at Sapita after the field ambulance was there. So what has Webb come, what conclusion does he come to? So in the end, um, it wasn't the questions about the Red Cross flag or the proximity of the main dressing station to the road, the wearing of armbands or the presence of weapons that swayed Webb. It was the proximity of 7th Division headquarters to the medical establishment and the likelihood that it was this rather than the main dressing station that was the actual and legitimate target of the attack. And I've since found another record, which was um, handwritten notes taken by, <coughs> there's a list of witnesses and evidence taken by Mr Sexton, who helped with the inquiry. And he noted that Norris's evidence and others who talked about 7th Division headquarters would establish that notwithstanding <coughs> the proximity of 7th Division headquarters, the bombing was deliberate. So he says, other than that factor, you could say it was deliberate, but because of this, proximity question, he argues that that's the reason they found it not to be warranted um, to be put up forward to the United Nations as a war crime. So that's the end of my presentation, um, except to just finish off with a quote from Winston Churchill, um, which sums up to me the work of all medical personnel in war. And interestingly, it was written in 1897 when Churchill was a cavalry officer in India under the intriguingly named Sir Bindon Blood. Um, and so this was before the 20th century even brought forward even more death and destruction. So Churchill wrote that the spectacle of a doctor in action among soldiers in equal danger, with equal courage, saving lives where all others are taking them, allaying fear where all others are causing it, is one which must always seem glorious, whether to God or to man. So thank you for your attention and for coming along and taking up the questions. Uh, yeah. I'll have the first question. So if we had found it as a war crime, would they have then gone as far as 
tried to track down individual pilots or the command of the Japanese? That was one of the key issues, that um, the, I, the issue of whether the crime was seen to be important enough, so you would argue that they thought that this was an important enough crime to investigate, but also what was the likelihood of um, being able to identify the pilots. Mm. I would say they could probably, from log books or whatever, if they could have got that evidence, but the Japanese um, had destroyed a lot of the evidence, but perhaps they could have tra tracked down the pilots. Um, the other issue that I wonder about is what's, how much of the full story might have come out if they did take it further. Again, this is me and my dad's conspiracy theory, but I don't know, I don't know, but I would say, because they did track down, I was reading that how hard they had to um, work on um, tracking down um, people who were guilty of the, um, some of the mistreatment of the prisoners because the prisoners identified the guards responsible by nicknames mm -hmm. or they didn't even know who they were. But they did manage to track a lot of them down. But the logistics of, the rounding of logistics of it um, made the whole process of prosecuting any of the war criminals uh, really difficult and quite arbitrary, um, from what I was reading. Uh, it was more than a token effort because the work that these guys did, the commissions and also the army personnel who went around, they set up their own division to investigate the war crimes and they went all across the Pacific and held the trials there and they really tried hard to get as much evidence as they could. But just the realities of it, plus as time passed, I mean this happened in 1942 and a lot of the crimes weren't really investigated, well they weren't investigated until after the war. So then you could see some of the inconsistencies just a few months later when they did in 1943 when those people were Yeah. So maybe with the... They did the interviews... <coughs> with the stretch of time further. Yeah, yeah. It was really fascinating looking at the discrepancies that so many people could see an incident happen and have so much discrepancy. But I guess we're all the same. If you have an event happen now, we all see it differently, report it differently. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Any other? So were there any other incidents that are apart from the essential the Japanese you know, bombing of uh, some field hospitals and so forth? Yeah, yeah. there were. There were, and we've investigated so a lot of yeah, no, we've investigated quite a few of them. Um, in most cases, you dismiss them as not as legitimate acts of war, in that in so many cases, there were legitimate targets nearby. Um, sometimes it was actually said that some of the Japanese attacks on medical stations were in retribution for Allied attacks on medical stations. There was a lot of this tit for tat, you know, who did it first, we don't know. Um, but there was, I'm trying to think what the locations of them were, but there were a few incidents close to Port Moresby, and I forgot the location. Um, but they looked at all those same questions. How were the tents dispersed? Were they camouflaged? Did they have the markings on them? Were they legitimate targets? And in most cases, there was some element that made them say it was not a legitimate, or was not a war crime. Yeah. Yeah. So just on a bit of a sidetrack, was there a cemetery problem there? Um, well, there were little groups of graves, as my understanding, John might know better, but um, I don't know if there was a formal um, cemetery there. Trying to trust what my father was. He observed burying of the dead. Yeah. And now it's something to assume that was at Sapuja. So I noticed on your map, mm. 16th Brigade headquarters was mm. down the road from mm. this hospital. I don't recall that talking about that specifically, but he was held out of battle. Mm. So I'm assuming those who were held out of battle at San Fernando, the 16th Brigade men, mm. were at the headquarters. And that, on that air photo, there's yeah. a whole big of tents. Yeah. And that's probably them in there. Yeah. So he would have observed the aftermath of that, but then actually, what he might have known exactly what was going on in the house. He was in the British Army, and that's what's going on. Essentially, I sort of worked out where he was after that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, as you saw on Nick's sketch, there were often groups of graves. Yeah, but then I gather that they did their best, even at that stage, to try and consolidate them mm -hmm. into a, a more of a cemetery area. And I know that, well, as you saw, the Sapir Cemetery expanded and expanded, mm -hmm. and, and there's photos of it later in the war. I don't know when Bom Bomana opened and became the sort of this mm -hmm. main cemetery. Um, but there are, there are lots of photos of Sapir as a formal war cemetery mm -hmm. after the war. 
So maybe it's likely that that was the main barrier there. Mm -hmm. It could, could have been practice too after World War One, where they buried them literally where they fell. So you know, in France, you know, it's just yeah. cemeteries everywhere. And you know, that's another thing that was sad for me, and, and I became a mission of mine. So many of these guys who were killed at Saputo, there was basically nothing left of them, mm -hmm. and so they were reported as they were reported as missing, presumed dead. Um, and so their names, they don't have a grave, their names are on the memorial to the missing in Vermont. Mm -hmm. And I went to Melbourne years ago, and it's just, it was such a stark thing to look at. They were basically like account books of the dead. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, that's the only way I could think of them, and at the head of papillary deaths, and that's where they reconcile. I don't know if anyone else has ever seen these. They're like a big book hardcover, and they're like this, and I just, you just mm -hmm. cry looking at them, and it's just divvied up, and then the names are down the side, the numbers, and where they were in battle, what happened to them, you know, so for example, Vic Group killed at Saputo, KIA, Saputo, result of enemy aircraft. That's why I went through trying to find how many exactly were killed. But some were at Saputo and then they're missing. So I'd go back into their records and you'd see that they were serving somewhere, they were taken to Saputo main dressing station and they were still there on the 27th and then they're missing. So you can clear that they're probably being killed in that attack. So, um, yeah, it's pretty hard to track all of them. Yeah, more than syndicators and production line. Yeah, yeah. And things like Rita and that, they have to break bodies for them and mm. all this sort of yeah. unpleasant stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly, not really nice. Yeah, I know it's not a very uplifting topic, but um, I think as an important issue, I mean, I, I just would say the event itself, but also I think you look at today's, Wars. Mm -hmm. You look at how clear is it that it's a war crime. I mean, look at what's happening in Gaza, um, and this idea of whether it's an important war crime, the idea of revenge of going in to get the hostages, and you know, um, the Americans and the Australians are saying, well, we're attacking the medical because they attacked ours, and so it just goes on and on, and it just shows you that it's shades of grey in, in war. What's happening in this Yeah, <coughs> exactly. That's yeah. So, um, yeah, the question of war crime would do an act of war. I mean, my initial reaction was a gut reaction that it was a war crime, but I have to say after everything I've looked at over the years, it's pretty hard to argue that there weren't reasons that they didn't and carry on that were quite, quite reasonable. Yeah. Did he have, were there any repercussions because he didn't with the... Yeah. <laughs> um, I haven't had any repercussions particularly with this. People said he was very well respected and people seem to just really accept the work of the commission was quite held in high regard. But there was very much public demand for something to happen. And um, as stories came back about the mistreatment of prisoners of war and that sort of thing, not specifically Saputa, but the Centaur sinking, the attacks on Darwin and all those things that raised people's passions was the big impetus for the government to instigate all of these. Towards the end of the war, a lot of people thought, right, we're going to get all the war criminals, like the Nuremberg Railway or the Nuremberg Trials in, in, uh, Germany, in Germany. Um, <coughs> they're going to try everyone responsible, everyone's going to get their just desserts, basically. But it really didn't happen. I mean, they did what they could do. They brought in uh, special acts so they could try criminals. But again, the reality of it, and also there was disputes over who was going to try them. So the Americans were doing the trials in Tokyo, for example. So when the Australians had Australians who were mistreated as prisoners or whatever, the Americans actually tried. There's hundreds of trials related to Australian soldiers that were conducted by the Americans in Tokyo. So, yeah, there were lots of um, grey areas. And of course, a lot of the Japanese themselves didn't survive the war. No. And so I didn't formally identify them. Yeah. Problematic in itself. And, yeah, and even the names, as I say, not just the nicknames, but um, they, they were saying that a lot of them were just, you know, they, they had a phonetic understanding of what the names were, they couldn't really identify. And then some were Korean as well. That's yeah. right, that's right, yeah. And then the issue of crimes committed against Australian servicemen, against Australian civilians, against the civilians, indigenous populations, there was lots of different aspects to it. Different categories, different. It looks really cold and hard when you look at the, you know, just trying to divvy it all up. Mm. You know, what's the idea? Practicalities are trying to do. Yeah. Yeah.
Any other further questions? Yeah, what are you going to do with your uncle's artifacts? The artifacts? Well, oh, but your uncle's uncle's Yeah. No. Well, with the diary, no, well, the the diary that's the basis of my, my books. Yes. yes. As the physical things, I've still got his dog tags, his medals, and his diary, and his armband, and his maps. And the historian in me says, Jane, you should donate those to the Australian War Memorial. Yes. That's yes. Yeah. But the rebel TV yeah. says, yeah. Yeah. they're my family. <laughs> and, and I love the idea as a historian that someone can go and look at those and feel yeah. them and touch them. Yeah. And, and they, they do give you that tangible contact. But I do worry that they'll then be put in a cupboard somewhere and yeah. got to make a deal with them.